two events uh, in this period. We have two sessions. The first session is only catalyzing uh, skills, opportunities, um, a potential for a direct uh, green economy in Africa and the global south. That's the first one. And then the second one, we are going to have it, it will be only, uh, uh, we are going to learn about education initiatives that support the green transition of tourism sector. So we have uh, four uh, speakers who are going to share us their experiences on a round table. And I'll call the names uh, of the speakers. The first speaker is Ruth Makumbo. She is the program director for Humana DAP Zimbabwe organization. Please come forward. Our second skipper, uh, speaker is Nicholas Ouma, Senior uh, Youth Advisor, African Union Commission. Our third speaker is Denjene Tezela, Director, Division of Agribusiness and Infrastructure Development, UNIDO. <laughs> Our fourth and last speaker is Muhammad Syed, Climate Change Specialist, Development Bank of Southern Africa. Please welcome again our speakers with a loud applause of uh, All right, as I've already mentioned, our session is on the catalyzing skills potential for a green economy in Africa and the global south. So I have some questions uh, to these experts who are in front of us. They are going to share us some experiences and the, what other initiatives are there or they are applying wherever they are working in terms of uh, uh, securing that we have uh, the uh, skills in green economy in Africa as well as the global south. And I would like to start uh, with um, Mr. Nicholas Auma. I have a question that he is going to uh, respond. So, Mr. Nicholas, why is it important to bring skills development to the forefront of the climate agenda in Africa? And how is the African Union supporting member countries to promote green growth through this development? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, why do we consider it's important to build skills. I have a few points on this. The first one is building a workforce for a green economy. The transition to climate resilient economy requires skilled workforce across various sectors, including renewable energy, sustainable agriculture, climate smart infrastructure, and resource management. So definitely investing in skills development ensures that Africa has the human capital that will be needed to implement climate action plans and capitalize on emerging green jobs. So we need a workforce for a green economy. Secondly, we also need to mitigate climate change and build resilience. Uh, skills development can equip individuals and communities with the knowledge and tools needed to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Uh, Africa is among the continents that have faced very adverse effects of climate change. And it is important that there are adequate skills that will enable uh, the citizenry to mitigate this climate change and also build resilience. 
This includes, as I've said earlier, skills in climate smart agriculture, water management, disaster risk reduction, and also resource conservation. So by investing in these skills, Africa can, Africa can reduce vulnerability to climate shocks and build a more resilient uh, future. The, my third point is creating jobs and promoting economic growth. Uh, the transition to green economy presents a significant opportunity for job creation in Africa. By investing in skills development, African countries can ensure that their citizens have the qualifications that are needed to fill these new jobs and contribute to economic growth. There is a lot that has been said earlier about, for instance, uh, digitization uh, ending up uh, with some challenges, particularly on jobs of the future. So this can also help reduce poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And then my fourth point is empowering communities and promoting sustainable development. Uh, skills development can empower individuals and communities to participate actively in climate action and decision-making processes by equipping people with the necessary knowledge and skills. They can contribute to local initiatives and also hold their governments accountable for climate action. This will foster greater ownership amongst the individuals and community at large and also sustainability of climate solutions. While the importance of skills development is evident, there are also challenges that need to be addressed as we seek to solve the climate action. Uh, one of these challenges is, for instance, limited resources. African countries often lack the financial and technical resources that are needed to invest in comprehensive green skills development programs. And the second one is also a big challenge, misaligned education systems. As we talk about climate change, education systems may not be adequately equipped to provide the skills needed for a green economy. We need our curriculum to address these issues so that education systems from the very, very basic level to advanced levels issues of climate change are imbued and are also included in the curriculum. And then another big challenge for the continent is the informal sector dominance. A large proportion of the African workforce is employed in the informal sector, which presents unique challenges for skills development initiatives. So we need to do more to ensure that also this informal sector have the skills necessary to address climate issues. Uh, what is the African Union doing? We have developed and ad are advocating for the implementation of the Continental TVET strategy and decade plan of action, where among the focus areas is the promotion of digital green and blue skills. We also have the Skills Initiative for Africa, which is a program being piloted in eight African countries with a very big emphasis on green skills. The second issue is that we are, at the African Union, are implementing the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and Action Plan, where increasing climate change literacy across all levels of formal and informal education and skills development curricula is one of the action areas. So at the policy level, we are ensuring that we are mitigating against climate change by implementing these strategies. The third element that we are doing at the African Union is we have partnered with UNESCO UNEVOC and we are implementing the Bridging Innovation and Learning in TIVET project and one of the focus areas in this project is peer learning, particularly in greening of TVET and equipping learners for the emerging green jobs by providing them with green competencies that can enable them adapt to changing work processes and profiles. 
Another strong area for the African Union is convening key stakeholders at the highest level. As, a, as an institution, we have the convening power and we convene stakeholders for policy dialogue, knowledge and experience sharing and engaging in mutual learning. There is much optimism that with the implementation of the African Union theme of the year, we are dedicating the year 2024 to education and skills development, the momentum on developing skills development systems that harness the potential for green transition will be sustained. So in a nutshell, these are some of the issues uh, that African Union is currently engaged in. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, uh, for um, well articulated uh, statements. I think he, we have so many takeaways that you have uh, highlighted in your, your message. So moving from uh, um, our colleagues from the uh, African uh, Union Commission, I would like now to uh, focus uh, and ask uh, Mr. Denenje Denjene Tedzera uh, from UNIDO. Um, Mr. Denenje, could you please explain how does the greening of Africa's uh, economy impact skills requirement and how is UNIDO supporting uh, the private sector in adapting to this green transition? In seven thank minutes, you. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. the moderator, and thank you for uh, Humana for inviting Inido to be part of this uh, discussion. We in uh, Unido um, appreciate or um, recognize the importance of the green skills, particularly in the context of uh, sustainable supply chains, which is a key, key priority of uh, Unido and also integral to the achievement of uh, the Sustainable Development Goal or 2030 Agenda. As uh, industries such as um, renewable energy, sustainable agribusiness, and waste management systems grow, they require a workforce equipped with specific green skills. And uh, this transition is particularly crucial for job creation, especially in developing Ah, okay, thank you. For developing countries uh, and uh, industrializing countries, I mean, it's good. One of uh, the key challenges for uh, the transition to these skill gaps is that is the critical part is uh, the, the skills, skills gap, which uh, my colleague from African Union mentioned, there's a mismatch between the demand and the supply of uh, necessary skills. So the Existing workers lack the skills needed to the management of these green jobs. This transition will also create new occupations and related qualifications and new skill profiles. So the transition to a green economy in Africa will definitely necessitate the upgrading of skills and adjusting the qualification requirements across the different occupations and industries and, uh, and the different uh, schooling systems in the countries in Africa. At UNIDO, we, we understand the critical role of uh, the skills development in supporting private sector during this transition. Our approach includes, uh, first of all, uh, demand-driven curricula for sustainability in global supply chains and the green economy. We focus on curricula and the training programs that are directly aligned with the needs of the green economy and also the needs of the private sector. So secondly, we foster also public-private development partnership, what we call PPDP, where we collaborate with governments private sector, usually multinational companies like uh, Volvo, and Festo, and so on, and development institutions or development partners like CEDA, the European Union, which are 
critical for this public-private development partnership. We also believe that the TVET system, which is led by the public sector, by the government, is usually ineffective. So from our experience, young people who have graduated from TVET needs reskilling and upskilling when they go to the world of uh, work. So there is a lot of big gap between what the private sector, the industries need and what is produced by the country. So this PPDP is a public-private development partnership facilitates the development and training programs, provide resources, and ensure alignment with the industry needs. That is uh, extremely important because the demand comes from the private sector and the private sector is providing the curricula for these uh, schools. I will give one example of our work in the green skills development in uh, Morocco. It's called H2 Maghreb. This project exemplifies this public-private development partnership involving the government of Morocco and then development partners um, like CEDA and USID and the private sector partner called FESTO and uh, E.ON Reality. And the national, let's say, counterpart is the uh, Office of Electricity and Drinking Water of uh, Morocco. So the primary objective of this project is to fill the huge gap in the water management practices by developing skills of a new and existing water management professionals operating at the national and district and municipal level. In a water scarce country like Morocco, the lack of skilled workforce prevents industry and agriculture from exploiting the full potential of uh, growth. Therefore, skills development in the sector is crucial to advance countries' green growth and climate adaptation strategies. The training employs innovative participatory and training program got a good job offer even before finishing the training, demonstrating that the enormous need for the skilled workforce in this sector. So this initiative is conducted in close collaboration with Deloitte and a number of private companies and the didactic uh, FESTO unit, and then uh, also the UN partner, UNESCO, UNOVIC, and then also for the University of uh, Morocco. The curricula were developed and are focused on the sustainability and the green bridging the skills gap. Looking ahead, our goal at UNIDO is to continue building this partnership and expanding our training programs. We aim not only to address the current skill gap, but also anticipate future skills and the needs for the green economy. This involves continuous dialogue with the private sector and understand the evolving needs and adapting our training programs accordingly. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you very much, Mr. Tezera. Maybe we can clap hands for him. <laughs> yes, we have heard from the public uh, and also from the private side. We also have uh, the side uh, to hear, from, especially from the civil society side. And then we have Rufi here, uh, who is a part of the civil society. Um, I have a question also for you, Ruth. Uh, my question is, what key challenges do you identify at the local level in achieving a just green transition? And how is uh, Humana addressing these challenges through its TVET um, colleges? Thank you, Enoch, uh, and good afternoon. So, as Humana, we operate 16 TVET colleges across eight countries in sub-Saharan Africa. While each TVET, it offers courses which respond particularly to the needs of the areas where it serves, and all the schools, they comply to the frameworks and systems of those countries. There are two common features across 
Humana Schools. One, it provides opportunities to vulnerable groups in rural and remote areas in our pursuit to complement the government efforts and leave no one behind. And number two, all the schools, they are embedded within the communities where they are and so that we reach the, the, they are embedded within the communities to serve as hubs for wider development. And coming to your question about the challenges, there are so many challenges that are common across the Humana Schools Network. Number one, it's about climate vulnerability. Rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And it is not only about adapting to the environmental shifts, but it is also about addressing, addressing the, the uh, it's about addressing the immediate injuries and health hazards and also climate change impacts such as, such as, uh, such as increased poverty, uh, psychosocial stress, and diminishing of households. Adapting to climate change and facing these challenges while pursuing for green transition is a big task. We can give an example of Cyclone Idai, which happened in 2019. It was the worst tropical cyclone to affect Africa and also on record in the Southern Hemisphere. The storm caused catastrophic damage and humanitarian crisis in Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. For example, the educational institutions, including the Tibet colleges, they lost days of classes due to the damage of infrastructure. And the students also lost days of classes as they returned home to their villages and they took time to resume classes. And it was because of the damage of the buildings where it needed some repairs, some maintenance, and some cleanup actions. And the other challenge is the lack of frameworks and outdated curriculum. Uh, when we look at formal curricula, it doesn't always incorporate the necess necessary skills needed for green economy. This automatically impacts our ability to equip the students with the necessary skills needed for the green economy. And all these processes, they require a political will, which sometimes takes long, and it is a big task. For example, in Zimbabwe, we have well-formulated policies in different ministries, in agriculture, in climate change, in education, and health, and many more. All these policies, they point to reskilling and upskilling for the green economy. However, the implementation and the enforcement of such policies is a challenge. Then we have another challenge, lack of trained instructors. In relation to my previous point, we can see that there is a, there is a shortage of, of instructors who have knowledge about climate relevant practices and technologies. Training of instructors to teach green skills is very crucial for a success of greening Tibet. We can also talk about inadequate infrastructure. In most of our Tibet schools, we lack infrastructure, laboratories, and equipment to facilitate green transition. For example, what happened with the cyclone Eli, the way it damaged the infrastructure, it is necessary to invest in climate resilient facilities which minimize climate learning disruptions. Low awareness and lack of interest is another challenge. Teachers, students, parents, the communities, they may have limited awareness and lack of interest to climate change related issues, green skills and careers. And in our effort to promote green economy, we need an active participation of the community. We need an engagement and enrollment of the community. We can also talk about financial constraints. We face financial challenges in the whole region to promote green economy and to invest in climate resilient 
facilities. There are also so many challenges. We can talk about poverty and economy, inequality, then mismatch between skills and job market needs. But how is Humana responding to all these challenges? Humana is already responding to these challenges in one way or the other. Our Tibet colleges, they offer lessons which include climate actions and green economy. For example, Humana offer courses in key sectors of climate smart agriculture and food production, renewable energy, and water management, and more. We can give an example in Guinea-Bissau. We have a green climate fund project which will see us training more than 450 youth on climate resilient agriculture, climate resilient livelihoods, and post harvest technologies and practices. We teach also needed skills that are in demand and are sustainable. And we provide students with, with mentorship opportunities. We also talk about raising awareness and community engagement. Here, we organize open days where we mobilize people to plant trees and we also mobilize the households, families to use firewood saving stoves in order to reduce the cutting down of trees. And we also talk about, we promote green school facilities. Here, some of our schools have already installed solar panels if already constructed biogas digesters and also implemented resource management. Here, we work with partners to invest in our infrastructure in order to improve equipment and have more climate resilient campuses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. I think uh, the audience has heard um, about how we are doing in, uh, in the side of civil society and how we are contributing to green economy. Uh, after hearing from uh, our colleagues from the public and also from the private side and the, from the civil society, uh, I think uh, some of the challenges which have been mentioned here, they are also uh, linking up to uh, finances so we are very lucky that we have our colleague, uh, Mohamed Sayed, uh, who is from the Development Bank of Southern Africa. I think we, we, he has also something to share with us. Uh, Mr. Mohamed, how can financing institutions collaborate with the government, uh, then business and education institutions to create a comprehensive and adaptable funding framework that address the evolving needs of skills development for the green transition? Uh, and uh, are there any specific instruments at the, um, the bank? Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you once again to uh, the organizers for inviting me and just to share, you know, perhaps a different perspective, you know, from a development finance institution. Um, we, are, we, of course, fund uh, projects, infrastructure projects, but we have historically you know, looked at various capacity building initiatives, including skills development in the green sector, and I'll share some examples of what we've done in the past and some key lessons that we've, uh, we've learned through that, and then some current initiatives as well, uh, which I thought you know, would be quite useful to mention. But I think what my fellow panelists have highlighted is skills is obviously an important part of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, without the necessary skills, you can have as much climate finance that you, that you need. And uh, you can have, you know, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, the right policies in place. But you won't be able to effectively execute these projects without the right skills. And you have different types of skills that, that are required. And I would like to focus perhaps on on one specific area we've been looking at as DBSA through the Green Fund, which is a national fund we've managed in South Africa for the last uh, couple of years. And um, a couple of years ago, we saw a specific need to support skills in terms of uh, green businesses, you know, um, 
encouraging young entrepreneurs to enter the green sector and to help transition South Africa to a green economy. And that required you know, a specific set of skills in terms of green businesses. And we all know that green incubators or business incubators have always been around. And um, there's always a need to equip young entrepreneurs with the skills to develop robust business plans, to understand you know, the markets, to market analysis, etc. So you can imagine the specific need when it comes to a new sector like you know, the green economy. And um, so we saw a need back in 2015 to support green incubators. And we looked at both uh, incubators that are supporting uh, entrepreneurs that are trying to advance innovative technologies, green technologies, as well as uh, kind of more the informal sector and, and young graduates from high school, or we call them high school, but it's, it's a secondary school in South Africa, mm. but also graduates from your universities of technologies in order to equip them with the necessary skills to, to start a green business. So we've, we've uh, you know, had quite a lot of success in terms of training these young entrepreneurs in that space through these green incubators. And what we found was, while there is still a strong need to, to offer that type of support, to offer mentorship, training, on-the-job experience is quite key, on-the-job training, linking with business, as you correctly pointed out, is quite important in order to link up uh, those young entrepreneurs with, with the right um, industries. And the other key lesson that, that came out of that intervention was uh, the need for more coordination. So currently, you have funders, you know, funding specific areas, and they have very specific mandates. So you have incubators, you have climate accelerators, then you have funders that support, you know, the commercialization of um, technologies, uh, climate technologies, or taking a business to, to the next level. But they all play at different stages of the development, and often what happens is that young entrepreneurs, you know, uh, apply for funding, they get funding to a certain point, and then they're stuck. And then you'll, fi you'll find that a lot of these entrepreneurs, unfortunately, cannot proceed, uh, you know, anymore because they, they're not linked up with the, the other types of funding that is required. So it's very important to have coordinated efforts to fund the, you know, the entire innovation value chain. So I think that's, that's a key area that, that we feel is, is, is quite key. In terms of current initiatives that the DBSA is involved with, uh, we are currently looking at uh, what we call D-Labs. These are specific precincts in, in, uh, set up in various communities, and I think um, the panelists have mentioned the importance of getting the communities to be involved. So what we've decided to do was to establish um, a platform or spaces where communities can acquire specific skill sets as well as opportunities to um, also establish businesses in, in, in that space. So it becomes a self-funding uh, precinct. Um, obviously, you, you need some initial funding to, to get things going. Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of opportunities for, you know, let's call it green precincts, where you can have opportunities to train communities on specific areas when it comes to, for example, uh, let's say renewable energy. So if you have communities that have traditionally been exposed to or dependent on fossil fuel based, uh, um, uh, you know, inter uh, uh, operations, we have now an opportunity to use these precincts to reskill and, and uh, repurpose, uh, um, you know, those operations and, and, and ensure that the skills in those communities are now uh, transition to, to obviously the renewable energy sector. So that's just one specific kind of intervention mm. that we're currently working on and we see, as I said, lots of opportunities to try and um, focus more on, on the green sector. So I think, uh, in short, uh, my main message is I think there is a lot of coordination required with, with government in terms of the enabling environment and policies, um, as pointed out earlier as well coupled with the right finance, which, uh, which we offer as a DFI. So we offer a lot of catalytic finance for, 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 for green businesses as well as projects. But um, the skills is obviously quite key as well. And the linking up with um, colleges in order to understand what are the needs in terms of advancing these 
green businesses and these technologies um, to support the green economy is, is quite essential. So without that coordinated effort and strong networks, um, you know, it, it will be very challenging. And I think that's something we're trying to push from, from our end as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Muhammad. Um, talking about opportunities, now it's to you, Muhammad. Um, maybe if you can just share us, you have talked more about being in South Africa. Uh, which other countries are you operating? Yes. So our mandate, um, as the name suggests, it's Southern De uh, Development Bank of Southern Africa. So mm -hmm. our focus is predominantly Southern Africa, but we do uh, operate outside SADC region as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of the green space, uh, we do a lot of work, um, you know, through our accreditation with the Green Climate Fund, where we are mandated to operate throughout the continent. Mm -hmm. And more recently, um, we've expanded our accreditation with a global environmental facility to cover the rest of Africa as well. So we see huge opportunities, um, especially with a Jeff on trying to encourage, uh, you know, nature-based solutions. And I think there's a strong need as well to get youth involved in that space and identify opportunities for nature-based solutions, um, you know, in that, in that area. As I mentioned before, some of the examples I, meant, uh, I mentioned are specific um, incubators in South Africa, but uh, there's another incubator that we supported historically, the Climate Innovation Center, which was a, uh, a global initiative where I think Kenya was, was kind of the hub for, for that center. But in terms of um, what we're trying to do in, in South Africa, there is huge potential to replicate, um, uh, you know, those opportunities throughout the region. So um, our mandate is, is, is continental. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we are running against time. I just have uh, to wind up, but I have one question maybe for you, all of you, for all of you to, to respond to. I think the question is what concrete uh, steps or collaborative initiatives do you believe are essential for ensuring that Africa, African youth are prepared uh, to harness the potential uh, of the green uh, transition? Maybe I can start uh, with you. Thank you very much. I think the first thing is we need to establish a very strong partnership with the private sector, which is uh, the main employer of uh, people with uh, skills. So in UNIDO, we work with the different um, private sector companies, multinationals like uh, Volvo, Scania, Hitachi, Komatsu, Toyota, and so on, mainly also on, on green jobs. This is one area which we have to. The other area we have to work is integrating green skills in, um, in all curricula. As you know, that there is a constant change in the needs of skills, and then we have to work um, with the government in, uh, in developing the right curriculum for green skills uh, development in TV. The third one is the scaling up of the training programs. As I mentioned, we have um, demonstrated in a smaller scale the potential of partnership with the private and public sector in green skills development. So we want to expand that one um, to, to a larger scale, again, through partnership where we need resources from the private sector as the public sector finance is not good enough for transition. The third one is uh, supporting learning across um, borders in different countries. We try to take this experience from one country and uh, contextualize it to another country to scale it uh, up is extremely important. And finally, training of trainers. As we all know, the skills um, lifetime or knowledge lifetime is now 10 years, so the half time is five years. In five years, most of our trainers lose half of what they know. So there is a continuous need for skilling and upskilling, and that uh, we have to work on that one continuously in partnership with, um, again, um, the private sector. I think uh, from UNIDO side, we always focus on the, as the demand comes from private sector, the role of private sector in designing the curriculum is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ruth, in 30 seconds. <laughs> Yes, thank you. We need to look at awareness raising and community engagement. Here we are saying that it is very important that we work with closely with the local leaders and the community-based organizations
to raise their awareness, understanding, and support the green education programs. And we need to promote the public and private partnerships to develop and implement green education policies and programs. And to ensure that education is market relevant and it addresses the environment challenges. Here, we need also to include the non-governmental organizations and the community-based organizations. And we need to consider financial mechanisms for green education and entrepreneurship to be accessible to TVET providers and young entrepreneur. And there's also need uh, for skill certification programs for green skills to enhance the credibility of green education. And lastly, I think it's good with the promotion of South to South cooperation for exchange of good practices that are applicable in the context where we work. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas, 30 seconds. Thank you very much. I just want to echo what my colleagues in the panel have said. Uh, number one is on education. Uh, I want to re-echo the need for uh, uh, integrating sustainable education across the curriculum at all levels, incorporating environmental topics uh, across various subjects like science, uh, technology, engineering, maths, STEM subjects, uh, promoting environmental literacy across the lifelong learning ecosystem by engaging particularly young people in interactive learning experiences and also media campaigns. We really need to take advantage of media to ensure that we are, uh, we are heard, our voices are heard. Number two is skills development, facilitating practical training in green technologies. Ruth mentioned the value of uh, TVETs in this. I want to re-echo the same uh, through STEM education and other hands-on learning experiences. Then the third one is empowerment and participation, creating platforms for young people and forums for debate and contribution so that young people can also contribute to the policy space and policy decisions and also supporting youth-led initiatives and projects. Of course, my colleague also mentioned the issue of offering fund, funding, mentorship, and also resources to enable young people to implement their own green ideas and also solutions. Thank you so much. Uh, Mohammed. if you have... Better singers. Yeah, and I think a lot of what I wanted to mention has been uh, mentioned already in terms of awareness. Uh, although I do think, you know, the, the youth are more aware than what they were, let's say, five, six years ago. Um, so I think, but I think there's still a need for, for awareness around the opportunities uh, in the green economy. Um, I think more support at, at the Asian stage. I think youth are not uh, polluted, you know, by preconceived, you know, um, uh, ideas. I think they come with fresh ideas. They come, they think out of the box. So I think we need to encourage that and support those ideas to be translated into, um, you know, strong plans, business plans. I think finally, for me, it's, it's about linking finance with enabling environment, a, a favorable a policy environment, and then very targeted capacity building initiatives. I think that's the key. Thank you very much, uh, our great panel. Uh, it has been uh, good and nice to be with you and also hearing from you all the messages and also the experiences that you have shared with us under this uh, catalyzing skills potential for a great uh, a green economy in Africa and the, the global south. Thank you very, very much. You can Now I'd like to invite Daniel Skefer, CEO for the Foundation for Environment. Thank you very much. Daniel Sheff, I'm the CEO of the Foundation for Environmental Education, and uh, we wanted to talk about how education can uh, manifest itself in terms of uh, vocational education and youth training and uh, in, in relation to environment cl and climate change. Um, and we thought that maybe what we'll do is, because we're this 
network of uh, many, many NGOs and organizations from around the world um, that are using our programs, and I'll, I'll say a few words about that, and also we have many partners that we work with. Maybe we can um, have this second part of this discussion at a bit of a lower level, uh, not so much about the policy or, or um, the policy making, but just give some um, nice examples and stories about things that are happening on the ground um, that are a uh, example of how we can uh, work on training youth and giving them the skills to have a better uh, future within the workplace um, and so on. So, just about ourselves, we're, we're this uh, organization that has been around since 1981. Uh, we've got about um, 105 uh, organizations that are members uh, and through the membership they get access to our programs. Um, three of these programs are focused uh, on the educational systems. Eco Schools um, is a holistic approach, a whole institutional approach to how schools, sustainable schools and green schools should be uh, operating. Uh, then we have another program which is called Young Reporters for the Environment. It's a program where we give young people um, the skills for leadership through learning how, how to uh, do this through media, uh, media skills. Uh, we have a program which is called uh, LEAF, which is learning about forests, and we call it learning about forests in forests. How do we reconnect young people to the nature to, to create that emotional bond that we're losing, uh, particularly with, uh, in urban communities? And, and then we also have <clears throat> Um, two programs that are focused on the tourism sector, and this is going to be a part of what we discussed today. The one is Blue Flag, which is an award that's given to particularly municipalities that manage their beaches in, a sustain, in, a, in an excellent, sustainable manner. And another program which is called Green Key, which is an accreditation for the hospitality industry. So th those would be hotels, attractions, conference centers, small accommodations, and so on, and we will touch on these two programs because we wanted to give a bit of a, of a view also on, on the business sector in, in, in this discussion. <clears throat> in fact, yeah, sorry. So this is just some of our numbers. We've got over 5,000, um, we have over 5,000 blue flags around the world. We've got uh, 4,500 hotels that are participating. Uh, green key sites. Um, we've got uh, about 21 million uh, students that are participating in our school programs. Um, and we've got a platform that we call the Fee Academy that I will, I will touch on uh, later on, which is an online platform for, um, for uh, based on a Moodle, a Moodle uh, platform, which gives uh, courses to different uh, stakeholders and audiences of our, uh, of our uh, programs. I would like um, to invite Ms. Leslie Jones um, and Ingrid, will you join us as well uh, up here? And um, I'll just say one little, uh, Leslie is our uh, president of FEE and she'll say a few words and then she'll moderate the rest of the session. Um, Ingrid is from Eichli, and she will, uh, will she'll give a uh, presentation as well, a speech as well. And I apologize, we've got two videos that we will share with you because people that we hoped would be here during these dates, by the time we knew when the event is going to take place, were un unable to join us physically, so they sent us uh, videos, and we hope that we can... Uh, share, share these uh, stories with you through video. And at the end of this, if we do this quick enough, what I would like to suggest is that we have an open discussion, have some questions, not only for our panel, but also for the previous panel, if there's comments from the floor, people want to, uh, to uh, contribute or ask, I think if we do this quickly enough, we will have some time for that as well. Thank you. Leslie, please. Thank you. Can you pass me your iPad? We're, we're doing a double act here. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so can I say welcome as well to all of you um, from the Foundation for Environmental Education. I've just been asked to sort of set the scene um, 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 with a few comments that will lead then into the questions that we're going to ask afterwards. So I would like to start by saying 
we are at a highly significant moment in the history of our planet. And one of my optimistic quotes um, from President Obama is that we are the first generation to feel the impact of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. So that is why FEE launched our strategy for the decade, Gaia 2030, in 2021, focusing all our work through our projects and our programs on empowering climate action, protecting global biodiversity, and reducing environmental pollution. The future of our planet relies on a green transition towards an environmentally sustainable economy. And this future economy will be one that addresses the causes of climate change, biodiversity loss, and environmental pollution, whilst fostering economic growth and social well-being. It will entail a transformation in the ways we work and live and the jobs that we do. This green transition must also be a just transition, one that supports good quality jobs and decent livelihoods, creating a fairer and more equal society in all parts of the world. Young people today are only too aware of the urgent need for this transition. They are leading advocacy and activism processes, calling for accelerated change in energy production, consumption patterns, and resource usage. They want to grow up to work in areas such as renewable energy, sustainable tourism and agriculture, marine conservation, eco-friendly construction, and many more that don't even yet exist. Jobs which prioritise environmental stewardship and social justice and contribute to building a fairer, more sustainable and resilient economy. As adults, professionals and leaders, our job is to transform and prepare our business sectors, putting sustainability and environmental management at the heart and centre. The Blue Flag and Green Key environmental accreditation programmes which FEE run for the tourism and hospitality sectors are leading the way in supporting this transformation. As Danny has mentioned, with over 5,000 marinas, beaches and tourism boats and over 4,500 hotels and other establishments awarded by FEE in over 60 countries around the world, it is clear that professional practices and operations are already changing as new sustainability standards and skills emerge. But a green and just transition isn't only about our economy, it's about our education. Education systems need to be reorientated and refocused to prepare this green future workforce. This will entail curriculum adaptation to reflect emerging green industries, the alignment of subject areas and course content with the knowledge which young people will will require, and the provision of relevant, practical, hands-on experiences and skills. As a sector, TVET is at the forefront of this process, and as lead partners of the Greening, as lead partners of the Greening Education Partnership, a UNESCO initiative, the Foundation for Environmental Education aims to scale up our support for TVET institutions in this agenda. Teachers are the key enablers in this process and comprehensive teacher training programs are needed to equip educators with the knowledge, skills and resources to effectively integrate sustainability concepts and environmental awareness into teaching practices. Our ESD programs, Eco Schools, Eco Campus and Young Reporters for the Environment offer the frameworks and 30 years experience in this work. As you will hear from our panelists and our um, guests on video later, new opportunities are being found to integrate this, this ex expertise within, within our sustainability, education and tourism programs to foster cross-disciplinary learning and provide practical applications for green skills. So without further ado, I will hand on to um, our first um, panelist and guest for the day. As I said, we're doing a double act. Yes. Um, and, um, which I've just now lost, Danny. Uh, sorry. So, 
Here we are, I can see it. Can you get this, rid of this? Thanks. Um, so Ingrid, Ingrid Cortez is director, and welcome Ingrid, director of biodiversity, nature and health at ICLE, the local governments for sustainability. And our question for Ingrid is, what type of skills local governments are looking for and how to communicate these needs to youth audiences having no or low access to the green job market? Thank you, Ingrid. Th thank you so much, Leslie. And it's really a great pleasure for me to be here, um, not just because um, youth and skills development is such an important thing, but also because we have a, a really long relationship with fee and with Blue Flag. And um, I must say, it did occur to me then when you were looking for the, the, the slide, that that's why we need youth. Yes. Because <laughs> they understand the IT and all of that. Um, so what kind of, of skills do we need from the youth? I think it's more than just skills. Um, I think we need the, the, the energy and the enthusiasm of the youth as well. Um, and when we, as a, as a city network, um, and we have uh, more than 2,500 cities around the world, um, when we advocate the, the voice and the ambition of, of cities and, and other levels of subnational governments, whether it's in the climate space or you talked about the, the, the new plastics treaty or the biodiversity space, um, it's always very, very important to make sure that we address not just the sort of content issues, the plastic pollution or the biodiversity loss, but that we also look at it from the perspective of intergenerational equity. So cities are really interesting places because they're often seen as where, where many, where, that's where the pollution comes from, or that's where, as a result of urbanization, our ecosystems are destroyed. Um, but cities are also very much um, hubs of innovation and of solution. And cities are where the young people very often, often live, and they go to the universities or they go to the schools. And I think it's, it's interesting to see that within our own organization, we have an increasing number of younger mayors, young leaders coming in. And that is, that is really important because they are the future. So, so when we look at the skills, I, I think it's partly around the skills of advocacy, the skills of how to express the ambition and the priorities and, and what, what it is that the next generation and the, and the citizens want. Um, and let's face it, in, in my own continent, continent, I'm an African, I live in Cape Town at the bottom of the world, as we always say. 60 between, depending on who you listen to, but between 60% of the African population is below the age of 25. So uh, I'm way over that age. Um, but, you know, it's quite a scary picture. There's this huge gap in terms of um, employment. If you look at the, the unemployment figures, um, it's really big. In, in some parts of my continent, where the average is around 11% of um, youth are unemployed, in my own country, South Africa, and we are an economically more wealthier nation on the continent, 46% of youth are unemployed. Um, in Djibouti, it goes up to 80 plus percent. Um, and one of the reasons why there's so high employment, other than the sort of the population factor, but a lot of it has to do with skills, skills development. So, so advocacy and and making the voice and the ambition of the youth the next generations and making the links between the older generation and the young people is, is really important. Um, and it's an interesting little anomaly for me that we have, we've got the youthful continent, but we're also one of the oldest, we, you know, the origins of humankind are from Africa. And I think it's really important that we maintain those links. Of, of between the young people and the old people. I think something else that's really important is um, business skills. In the previous panel, we were talking about um, business skills. My fellow South African was talking about what we're doing around the green economy um, and entrepreneurship. 
Young people are not scared to take risks. I'm very scared to take risks. I've been around this block many times. But young people are not prepared to, uh, scared to take risks. And we need to create the, 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 the programs that will help them see where, you know, what are the best practices? What are the, how do you navigate the bureaucracies? How do you understand what, what the investors are looking for? Um, and particularly within in the tourism sector, I think it's it's an area in, in certainly in, in the southern parts of Africa and East Africa. Also, tourism is a very important component of the GDP and of job creation and employment creation in the country. And that tourism is linked to nature, whether it's a game farm, whether it is um, a beach or whatever. So there's there's this nexus of youth skill tourism and, and nature. Um, I think something else that's really important is um, building skills in how to take decisions and how to be accountable. They are the future. They're going to be the next mayor or the next governor or whatever the case may be, or they may just be a concerned citizen. And it's understanding how democracies work, how decisions work, how to develop budgets, how to integrate planning as well as budgets and reporting. So I think that's also, also a very important thing. And I think um, finally, for me, what, what is also something important is the implementation skill. How do we take ambition and making decisions around policy frameworks and our ideas, entrepreneurial <coughs> ideas or whatever, and actually implementing? And for the implementation is you know, there's always, uh, we always say that Africans, particularly South Africans, we're very good at making laws. We've got some of the best laws in the world, but it all fails at implementation. Why? Because we don't necessarily have the skills, the project management skills. We don't have always the stamina in terms of monitoring and those corrective loops, learning from our monitoring. Where did we go wrong? How can we fix this? How can we be more accountable? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Thank you. That, the, the sort of complexity, but that importance of that holistic approach, looking at all aspects of the skill set that's needed. So thank you very much for that, Ingrid. So um, next, I am going to attempt to show you a video. Um, and um, Dr. Stefan Hanselmann is head of the GIZ, which is the German development um, um, funding body um, um, uh, that is working with us and supporting um, some of the work that we're doing um, in Cambodia. So my, our question for um, Dr. Stefan is, in a Southeast Asian context, how and why are you using vocational education to develop sustainable tourism in Cambodia? Greetings, everyone. I am Stefan Hansenmann, head of the GIZ Icon program in Siem Reap, Cambodia and I'm delighted to share with you our journey towards sustainable tourism in the Kingdom of Wonders. We strongly emphasize vocational education and training as a powerful tool to promote the idea of an industry that is built on quality and sustainability. For our partners from the tourism sector, sustainability is no longer a trendy buzzword. It has, has rather evolved into an essential ingredient for the long-term development of this very important sector. Paying tribute to its relevance for employment and income generation, GSZ ICON strategically uses vocational education to transform industry standards. Our aim? To enhance quality and sustainable practices that meet customer needs, offer generate local experiences, and protect cultural and environmental heritage. To start, we invest in building the capabilities of vocational training institutions. We concentrate on educators and enable them to integrate sustainability into their teaching. This helps to ensure that future professionals are well informed about sustainable practices. Next, and in partnership with the Foundation for Environmental Education, we are leading the way in establishing eco-schools in Cambodia. By collaborating closely with respected hospitality institutions, 
We not only support innovative ideas and clear guidelines, but also encourage an active approach. Students play a key role as change makers, driving sustainability within schools, rather than simply following traditional top-down instructions. Lastly, we are introducing an internationally recognized label for companies from the hospitality and tourism sector that operate sustainably. Through on-the-job trainings and upskilling of employees, we help to nurture a skilled workforce capable of implementing and maintaining eco-certification practices, making a real difference in Cambodia's tourism and hospitality sector. In the context of Southeast Asia, a region where many livelihoods depend on tourism, our approach centers on recognizing vocational education as crucial in developing sustainable tourism. This goes beyond equipping the workforce with necessary skills. We also strive to foster a genuine spirit of sustainability and quality where the preservation of nature and culture goes hand in hand for the benefit of people and communities. So thank you um, very much to Dr. Stefan. And I think um, one of the important things for me there is the comment he made about sustainability no longer being a trendy buzzword. It does give you hope and optimism that it is now genuinely embedded in um, you know, many of our significant um, um, hospitality organisations, hotel sector and so on. So now I'm going to um, hand back to, um, to Daniel, our CEO, um, who's going to share a little bit more uh, about um, FEE EcoCampus, um, one of our programmes, um, as a tool to influence future teachers and hospitality staff. Thank you very much, Leslie. So, um as I described in the beginning, we have a program which is called Eco, Eco Schools. We have about uh, 50,000 of these Eco Schools around the world and about 21 million students participating in Eco Schools. This program has been running for about 30 years. So in fact, there are students that have always been in an Eco School. This has always been part of their educational journey. So when these young people arrived in universities, um, they looked up and they didn't see the green flag flying over their, over their uh, campus. So they challenged their universities and said, why are we not eco-schools? From that, we've had an organic growth into a new program that we are uh, now setting as its own independent program, which is called uh, EcoCampus. It follows the same educational principles that I will talk about in a moment of the eco-schools, but obviously, it is a much more complicated in terms of te uh, technical um, challenges, in terms of um, uh, staff that we need to involve. Universities are not primary schools, they're a bit more complex uh, organizations, but we have now 183 of these. And as FEE took this role of leading pillar one of the Greening Education Partnership, which is focused on greening schools around the world, FIA's Foundation for Environmental Education. Um, we started to think w w what, how, what kind of elements can we bring into the work that we're doing, which is not only on school, regular public schools, but also looking at um, our eco, eco campus program in order to uh, impact the future, uh, f uh, future employees and, and, and the working place. Um, so, one of the things that we've done is we've developed a platform, as I said before, which is called the FEE Academy, and this uh, FEE Academy uh, has about 20 courses now that we give our different stakeholders. For example, um, how, do you run, how do you run a certification for a, a green key certification, or how do you run a blue flag breach? How do you make your audits and your control visits? All these type of uh, uh, programs, um, the, uh, courses that we've developed are aimed in supporting, uh, in many cases, the teachers that teach in these uh, institutes. So um, let's go to the next slide. Um, the Eco Schools itself, as I explained, and the Eco Campus is based on a seven-step methodology. And this is very important because what we're, 
what we're doing is we're focusing on an educational process. These seven steps are actually an educational process. The first thing that the, uh, the, that the school needs to do, or the, the campus needs to do, is that they need to create an eco-committee. The second thing, and, and this eco-committee has to involve all the different stakeholders of, of, uh, that are involved in the school. So it could be, uh, the, obviously, the students, and they actually are required to lead this process. The faculty, the management, the technical staff of the school, and um, the community around it, so maybe the municipality in which the eco campus is sitting, uh, and maybe civil society organizations and so on. So we, we're trying to create a committee which is quite uh, broad in its um, holistic view of the school or the campus. Carry out an environmental review, so check what are the environmental aspects, uh, challenges that you're facing as, as a school, what are the things that might need to be changed and so on. Link this to your curriculum. Create an action plan. Um, monitor and evaluate the action plan. That's very important and I think you were touching on this, that we need to have the self-assessment built into our culture and if we don't have that then uh, things get stuck or, or we don't really improve or, or we're not really transparent about what we're doing. And the last thing uh, is in, uh, sorry, not the last one, we inform and involve, so we don't want only this eco-committee to be involved, we want the whole community around the school to get involved in what we're doing. And the last thing is to produce an eco-charter. So it's really funny because in a, in, in, in a primary school, which these seven steps also work very well, that charter can be a song that the children sing every, every morning. But in a, in a university, it could be a much more complex set of um, uh, um, uh, rules or, or um, uh, decisions that we take as a body that we want, you know, this is our pledge, these are the do's and the don'ts that we do. And if you look at this thing and you look at this eco, uh, eco um, code or eco chart in the end, that is really a manifestation of change in culture. That's the culture in the school. That's what we want to do. We want to change culture, and through changing of culture, we want to change behavior and practices. Why am I telling you all this story? Because when we got into the GEP thing, to the, the Greening Education Partnership, which aims today to reach 50% um, um, of schools around the world by 2030 would be accredited or part of some Greening School program, which is a huge, uh, huge challenge. Um, we thought there's two audiences that are directly connected to what we're doing in other programs that we can try and influence. One is the hospitality industry, and this is the pro project we're doing with GIZ in Cambodia. It's um, not only teach teachers how to teach sustainability in a hospitality school, and by doing that prepare the young students that are in the school to their role as uh, future employees within the hospitality industry, but by making their school in Cambodia an eco-campus, let them really experience, not only academically, but actually go through the process of understanding how you run a sustainable entity. So that is true, that's what we're doing today in, in Cambodia, and we've just reached, we've got the first school that has been actually um, assessed, so we go through, they, they need to do a, quite a complex documentation of the process that, that they go through. They've been assessed and we've got the first eco-campus flying a green flag in, uh, in Cambodia, just, by the, just an important thing, the flag is given for two years. In those two years, once they've been assessed and they get the flag, you expect them to start this process again. So it's a perpetual motion of deepening the commitment and the culture of the school to, um, to the um, sustainability factor. The other area that we feel that we need to drive this eco-campus thing is into teacher training uh, schools. Because there, not only, not only are we focused on um, teaching the teachers sustainability, allowing them to uh, understand, provide them with the lesson plans and, and, and so on, but in the end of the day, our aim is that when they get to their schools, they make their schools eco-schools. And if they don't experience that as a student within an eco-campus, it will be much harder for them then to pull it off in the school. So 
This is, a, this is really a kind of an investment in our own programs, um, through our own programs, and we, we believe that by doing this and by uh, working with, um, nation, with national policy makers in the tourism industry and in the, uh, educa in the ministries of education, we will be able to create the system where we are supporting through our programs um, future um, uh, teachers, future hospitality industry um, staff um, to better understand what we're, what we're trying to do and to support us in, in the future. Thank you very much. So um, our last uh, presenter um, is another video um, from um, Wessa. Wessa is our um, fee member in South Africa, um, one of our most established and important members um, um, within our network. So um, I will now hand over, hopefully, to, um, to Cindy um, to share um, a little bit more. Um, and the question that we've asked is, how has Wessa used its national blue flag program as a vessel to support professional development of marginalized youth in South Africa. WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, is an environmental organization which aims to initiate and support high-impact environmental and conservation projects to promote participation in caring for the Earth. The Department of Tourism and the Expanded Public Works program have entered into a partnership with WESA in implementing the Blue Flag program in South Africa. And the main objective of the EPWP is to make sure that they create jobs and skills development through the tourism sector. The Blue Flag is a global eco-label indicating standards of excellence in the environmental management of participating beaches, tourism boats and marinas. Having blue flag status is a key tourism attraction. At first glance, it's quite difficult to measure the success of a project that is as big as the tourism blue flag project, purely because of the size of the project and the fact that it's a multi-stakeholder project that is implemented across three coastal provinces. But with TBF, one can easily identify and measure the impact and the success of the project. WESA has partnered with the National Department of Tourism to recruit, train, and place youth tourism graduates as beach stewards at West Flag establishments. During the student year, has been, um, when they arrived, we put them with strength and can shine in those strengths. We'll seeing them grow in their roles and taking on the responsibility and become active in the hotel. The mission of the Two Oceans Aquarium and the Education Foundation is to inspire and connect people with nature. And having the Blue Flag Beach stewards part of that environment and bringing their knowledge and their passion and their experience at the beaches the aquarium enhances the visitor experience. With a lot of support, encouragement and push, I was able to be part of the most integral aspect of the tourism industry. Working for Green Corridor has given me more insight about how tourism industry works. At Green Corridor, I've done so many duties. I've faced and dealt with many issues, and I've even learned to operate at office alone, which put me outside of my comfort zone, forced me to think outside the box and to learn to adapt. And here at Shark Spotters, we believe that we were granted the amazing opportunity to work coincide with the stewards, to work and achieve a collecting goal, to be able to protect our oceans and our sensitive coastline. Just to the point of view of our stewards that are with us currently from WESA, um, they've been a huge help over the last two years. Having the extra hands on board, running boats is um, quite a labor-intensive thing. There's lots of heavy lifting and uh, keeping the boats clean is always a challenge. Weza stewards, they are helping us a lot in so far as educating people uh, on matters pertaining to how to litter 
and other things so that we keep our beaches clean. The Wesser Tourism Blue Flag project has given us a real opportunity to promote our beaches and tourism companies are able to achieve international blue flag status. And that's against the backdrop of the global COVID-19 pandemic. We've also been able to train 420 disadvantaged youths. We've upskilled them in being able to become employable in, in the tourism sector, but also to be able to start their own small tourism businesses. We'd like to thank the National Department of Tourism and all our blue flag beaches, municipalities and tourism hosts for partnering with us to sustainably transform South Africa's marine and coastal tourism environment. Thank you. So I think an inspiring story and also just an inventive, you know, looking at ways in which a program, which is an eco-label, but can actually be used um, to, um, to, you know, create this wider picture and bring skills for people, particularly in, in this case, in more mar real marginalised communities. Um, so um, that's it from our side, but we have got um, a few minutes. Um, and please, if anyone has um, a question, um, for Ingrid or for Danny or for me, um, um, please ask now um, and we will try and answer. And maybe also for the previous panel. We yes, have, sorry, we have, we have, yes. Still, you're still from, with us, so if anybody with wants a comment. Ruth is still or? here. I can see Ruth. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Would you be kind, though, just to state your name and where you're from? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dosun. I'm from Nigeria. I'm the director of programs at Clean Technology Hub. <clears throat> Excuse me. My question is for Ingrid, actually. Um, talking about education and all of that, um, the NGO that I work for, we're trying to create an e-learning platform where we can put courses online and try and get people to register and, you know, take those courses. Uh, we have a huge problem maybe in Nigeria where it's difficult to get people to be involved in climate action and environmental change. They keep saying things like, uh, we're, not, we're not involved in this, it's not our problem, we don't produce so much carbon emissions, and yet we're suffering the effect of climate change. My question is, how do you, this is one thing for us to actually create this content and put online, but it's quite another to get the educational sector or even people interested in taking these courses. Uh, people would rather go to school to learn how to become a doctor, an architect, an engineer, because that's where the money is, right? And people go to school so that they can have, they can fund the lifestyles that they want. How do you get people, especially in Africa, to be more involved to see that, well, there may not be so much money, but how do we remove selfishness and start thinking of living a better earth or environment for future generations to come? Because that is a problem that we are currently facing now in our hub. The courses are ready, but how do we get people to be interested in these things? Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Thanks. That's a really very good question. And it, it's a huge problem throughout our continent where people think that it's the lawyer the doctor and the engineer, um, that, you know, that they have this idea that that's where the work should be. So, so one of the things that, that we do is we work with, um, with our cities very closely. We get the political leadership, and often they have the community structures through their wards and their political representation that they have access to youth groups or to women groups or whatever. And we've just started a program, a project now a little while ago called um, Afri Food Links, where we've introduced the system of youth ambassadors. And we're in, we're, so we did a call to get these youth ambassadors to come up. There's a cohort of, I think, five at the moment, and ultimately we hope to have some more. Um, and, and really it's about getting the young people to become involved in this project. It's about food. And, and nutrition, 
Um, but to understand why it's important that we need to have farmers, the next generation of farmers. We can't all be doctors. Um, we do need to have farmers, we need to have nutritionists, we need to have people working in the food industry. Um, and it's really teaching them through learning and through working with, with an organization like our own and exposing them to international platforms and to what happens at cities um, to a new world out there of different types of work so that it's not all of us getting a, a qualification and then ultimately also becoming unemployed because there are only so many doctors and, and engineers that we need. So that, that is one way. Um, and I think those, those initiatives that we've run, we've worked, for example, um, in the past with um, Gibbon, which is the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, and they have branches all over, and they, they run a very similar sort of process. Um, I think something else that we do too is when we implement projects at the city level, for example, it might be a biodiversity project, or it can be an energy project, or a climate resilience project, we always involve, we have the sort of whole of society approach. So we definitely, we work with the mayor and the political leadership, the technical leadership, the other levels of government, the national ministry, etc. But we always bring on board the, the stakeholders, the beneficiaries, the people that are most affected. And we start, we help facilitate that dialogue. Um, there was a project some years ago where we were working in Malawi, um, in Lilongwe, where there was a huge issue with a polluted river. And along the river, there was a massive informal market. Um, and the, the planners and the engineers didn't, they didn't dare go in there because there was so much animosity and tension between the, the, the marketers and the traders and the people living there and the, the sort of decision makers and the mayors and the planners. And through a process of dialogue and talking and getting together, we got them to understand each other's different agendas and they came up with their own solution. They cleaned up that market, they organized themselves, it was youth, it was um, the, the old people, it was the women, um, it was uh, the tomato growers, um, and they came up with a solution out of their own that the city could live with. And so those are the sorts of co-production types of things. And, and yes, skills training. We also have a platform, but you're right, it's not easy to get them. Yeah. Thanks, Ingrid. I think, Danny, you just want to add something? I, I, wa I want to make a maybe a philosophical uh, comment here, because this is something that I just heard what you said. I, I think that we need to, um, when we're talking about climate justice, we need to stop doing this them and us. It's not, it's not contributing anything to it. If you're living in the north, you think you, and, and you part of this consumption self, uh, very selfish sometimes uh, culture. Uh, it's not my problem, it's the south's pro problem. If you're in the south, you say, well, I, it's not, I'm not causing, somebody else needs to deal with it. I don't think this is, I, under, I understand the complexity. I'm not, I'm not saying that the justice is not part of it, but I think that dividing our problems into them and us is not the way to solve this problem. Thank you. Now we've got less than a minute to go, so I think we'll um, draw it to a close. Um, thank you all very much indeed um, for your participation. It's been good to work with you as well, Humana. Um, and um, thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you. Thank you.